Good morning, everybody. Um, welcome to this webinar. Um, thank you for joining us today. My name is Jill McCusker. I'm the sales manager at Spirac. I'm trying to make sure the video is working okay. Give me one second. Okay. okay, good. So you guys can see us on our screen. We see somebody else's name, but as long as everyone can see us, we're good to go. Um, today, Robert and I are presenting tips and strategies on how to select the right biosolids equipment. Um, starting with possible transport methods and storage solution options. Um, and then we'll, we're going to, towards the end of the webinar, we're going to go through some of our case studies that involve um, focusing on conveyance and then storage solutions. Uh, just a little housekeeping before we get started. Uh, today's session is being hosted by the Zoom webinar platform. Listen, you're in the listen and view only mode. So when you check your audio settings, all you really have to worry about are your speaker settings. So make sure everything's at a comfortable level. Maybe put in some headphones if you'd like. You won't have to worry about microphone or video settings as you're in that listen and view only mode. Bottom of your screen is how you can interact throughout the session with us today. We have our raise hand tool. So if everyone can hear me okay, go ahead and raise your hands. Perfect. And if throughout the webinar there's any issues with video or sound, just post it like a question and we'll take care of it. All right, so I'm gonna go ahead and lower your hands. Thank you, everyone. And next, I'm going to, next to the raised hand, you have the Q&A panel. And this is how you can ask your questions as we walk through the session. I do encourage you to post questions at any time during the webinar. And please don't use the chat function to ask the questions because the Zoom platform does not notify the presenter of any chat updates. Uh, and the webinar will get recorded and you'll all get a copy of it through email uh, once we're finished. Uh, now, without further ado, I'm handing you over to Robert. He's our application engineer and he's gonna go over the first part of the webinar. Thank you and we're gonna, you're gonna lose the video of us, but you're gonna get our presentation. So thank you very much. And there we go. Good morning, everyone. Um, Joe said, Robert Litton here. Uh, I've noticed on the uh, attendee list some people that we're familiar with. Hi to everybody and glad to make the new acquaintances. Um, I've been with uh, Spyrac about eight years. I, I'm an applications engineer and uh, prior to that I was in engineering. Um, so I been here a little while, seen a few different things. Um, focus for today, again, I've already done the introduction. I'm doing the biosolids handling portion of it. Jill will take over with the storage and transport uh, case studies, and then we'll both kind of tackle the Q&A. Um, highlights um, of spy rack shaftless uh, conveyors are uh, the high capacity, long continuous runs at low RPM, uh, which extends the uh, wear part life. Sorry, um, guys. Sorry, I can't see the. Uh, nobody can see your PowerPoint presentation. Just FYI. <laughs> okay, thank you, Peter. Um, we'll get that corrected. <clears throat> and one moment while we're having. A little bit of technical. This is our first Zoom platform, so please forgive us for uh, a little bit of technical difficulty. Share screen. Okay. Yeah. Okay. And then share screen. There we go. I apologize. That was my
Okay, how does that look, Peter? Can you uh, give us some insight there? Beautiful. <laughs> okay. Now that everyone can see, let's do a quick start over. <laughs> All right. Um, well, for those of you that missed it, this is just basically some bullet points, what we're going to cover today. Um, again, like I said, I'll take care of biosolids. Jill will pick it up from there and we'll both handle the Q&A. Um, uh, again, on this slide, we said we've got high capacity. That's what shaftless spirals or conveyors are all about. Uh, long runs without the need of intermediate or hanger bearings, low RPM, which extends the life of the wear items, low power, Again, less wear, um, space saving. We can actually handle some pretty large objects. Um, and we have fully sealed units, which aids in odor control and material containment. Um, what's up here now is a couple different um, U trough, or I mean trough configurations. The one on the left is a U trough conveyor, typical. We use that for up to 30 degrees, sometimes 35 degrees. There's a variance there. Um, when we go from 30 or 35 degrees to 45 degrees, we use the octagonal trough configuration as well as in vertical applications. Um, both units are pretty robust, fully sealed, as mentioned before. Um, what we've got up here now is our liners. Um, one thing I'd like to point out on the liners in the lower left-hand corner is um, this particular product is the only one available in the market that has two colors of the same material. Um, there's others out there that do not have the same material, but um, what that does is the uh, gives the users or maintenance people an advantage. And just real quick, what um, an example of that would be is if you have a conveyor with this particular liner in it, um, it, and it operates for eight years before you see the yellow color pop up, um, that means you probably have another two years of wear before it wears completely through. And the advantage of that is um, the, being the same material, you can order the material if you don't want to keep it on the shelf as a spare and schedule your maintenance. So a distinct advantage there. The upper pictures there just show the method of containment um, there's no bolts, basically, so the liners pop in and out. Um, and when they're being changed, you can figure about 10 to 15 minutes per liner section. Um, in the lower right corner, those are the uh, liners that you would receive as a replacement part. Um, just want to point out real quick that it's very important to leave them banded in that configuration until you're ready to replace them. Uh, the material properties of that particular material, the, it wants to relax and lay flat. That's the reason why we uh, suggest that. Um, here's a pretty good illustration of the versatility of the conveyor connections um, in shaftless conveying. Um, if you'll notice, there's a couple uh, spots down there in the bottom, and I can highlight this. That one conveyor feeds directly into another conveyor. Uh, what that does is, uh, and we're able to do that because there's no end bearing. Um, and I'm comparing to a shafted conveyor now. But um, what that allows, it, it, the versatility is so much greater in the, uh, the configurations. We can save space and um, there's no need for intermediate bearings, like I said. But um, just real quick, we've got a depiction there of horizontal, inclined, vertical, horizontal, as well as distribution conveyors. And we'll get into each one of those a little bit more as we move through the presentation. Um, again, I'm gonna highlight the different connections here and hopefully we can get the uh, animation to work. But starting on the left, um, there we go. Yeah, that shows just a transition point from one conveyor to another. We're going from horizontal to an incline. And that shows the material uh, transitioning from one to the other. In the center um, shows the incline unit going to a vertical unit. Um, and it's the uh, just the transition and how the material operates in there. Pretty good depiction there. Um, but what it does, just want to point out there on the vertical unit, that unit does need to be 
um, a higher percentage of trough fill to operate properly. And what that does, and they usually run at a few higher RPM than the inclined or horizontal. Um, we need to do this because as opposed to the material being pushed out the end or dropping out its intended discharge, it actually is kind of, for lack of a better term, slung, slung or sling the material out. So um, just a key point with the verticals, uh, not, hopefully everybody's familiar with the vertical stuff. Um, and there's our animation to transition from the uh, vertical unit going into a horizontal unit. And what we've got depicted here is it going into a storage unit. Um, this can actually transition right into a loadout unit as well, or distribution type conveyor. So uh, pretty seamless. It just kind of, the material's thrown out of the vertical unit and then goes into the horizontal unit for uh, transport. And what we've got here now is an exploded view of our, um, one of our typical standard U troughs. Um, but what I'd like to do is bring your attention to the uh, uh, picture in the center bottom. It shows our shafting, shaft coupling disc, spiral coupling disc, and gusset plate. Um, the reason I'd like to bring your attention to this is because we uh, focus, our quality is focused on the concentricity of the entire spiral as a unit. Um, we feel that's very important. We manufacture our own spirals that allows us greater quality control to maintain that concentricity. Um, what we do is we take our spiral and our spiral disc, and that's fixtured, um, and it is uh, dial indicators used to maintain that concentricity throughout the entire length. And when they're coupled together, it's actually welded to the spiral with a gusset plate. The gusset plate helps transfer the torque from the drive shaft through a section of spiral. So it's not concentrated in one area. Basically, it doesn't break at its highest concentration of torque. Um, also, real quick, on the shaft and the shaft coupling disc, um, that's a machined component. Uh, once the shaft coupling disc is welded to the shaft, drive shaft itself, um, it's then faced off and uh, to maintain the perpendic perpendicularity between the uh, shaft, the axis of the shaft and the face of the shaft coupling disc. Basically all this does going through uh, to sum it up is what it does. It maintains good concentricity throughout the entire length which maintains or allows the spiral to last longer. It removes any wear or bending um, throughout the length of the spiral. In the upper left hand corner, uh, we call that a bell housing. It's actually a shaft seal system. Um, it's basically gland packing that's secured tight around the OD of the drive shaft. And then there's a grease fitting that grease is pumped in and it kind of fills in any voids. Um, it's just basically to, the bell housing's basically there to mount the drive unit, gearbox, and um, provide a seal system. Another advantage of this feature or a feature of this particular um, item is it's open to the atmosphere. So if there is a failure in the sealing system, um, it will drip to the atmosphere and not directly onto the drive unit. Um, and another thing is that I, I don't think it's depicted here, but as a standard, we're, we've incorporated a labyrinth seal on the interior of the um, conveyor assembly. And what that does is add an extra element of seal to the uh, entire assembly. <clears throat> And what we've got here is a different type of spirals. Um, real quick, an A-spiral is just a singular bar stock um, formed into a diameter and pitch. Um, A-B is two um, pieces of bar stock formed, welded. And what that does, basically, the A-B, it increases the surface face. Um, oh, let me back up, sorry. The A-B is actually our most common unit uh, supplied. Uh, we use that in probably 80% of what we do. Um, 
and the short pitch. Um, but anyways, the AB unit, the second bar stock, if you can see in the little uh, blown up view to the right of the AB, um, you can see the surface face is increased. So that allows us greater um, capacity in the conveyor. Um, real quick, the short pitch, um, we call it a tight pitch sometimes. Um, what that does is that's needed on the incline conveyors um, or applications where um, we have a greater amount of fallback. The pitches are, the, are actually closer to each other and they, uh, they, um, <clears throat> that helps convey the material more efficiently. Um, and then with the, uh, the F spiral, that's actually a more reinforced. You'll probably see more of an FB spiral those are, uh, it's reinforced the F portion, yellow as you see it, actually helps with the elongation or compression of the spiral. You'll see that on long runs. Um, the E spiral is pretty rare. We've used it in some maybe scraping applications, things of that nature, but that, that's a real rare used item. The VB spiral is used in the octagonal troughs, if you remember from a few, uh, few slides earlier. Um, and what we need to do there is, you know, actually make it a little bit larger so it almost touches the sides of each of the, uh, the walls of the octagonal trough. And what we got depicted here is a distribution conveyor. Um, it's got a couple slide gates there. Uh, looks like it would be reversing. We have a horizontal uh, conveyor feeding it, but um, the features on that is it can be fully all automated. Um, we can incorporate some ultrasonic level sensors um, along with the electrically actuated slide gate. So it's basically a hands-free unit, um, fully automated. <clears throat> and what we're showing here is another configuration uh, called a slewing conveyor. Uh, if you can kind of focus on the A-frame arrangement, it's set up on a pivot system. Allows you to not use the uh, distribution conveyor shown in the previous slide, but it is set up on a bearing. So it, 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 like I said, it actually pivots. Um, I think this one may be a manually operated unit. Somebody has to push it or we have driven units. So it can be automated as well. Um, and here's a really good illustration of, again, our versatility um, where we would have an advantage over a shafted unit. Again, at the end of the horizontal conveyor, there's not an end bearing to interfere with the transition point. Uh, we've actually used, and if you can see this, uh, if you remember I mentioned uh, slide, previous slides, um, that's an octagonal trough. So we're in that range of 30 to 45 degrees on that incline. And it looks, yeah, as the um, note says, it's 35 degrees. So we would use an octagonal trough there. But anyways, um, this is, we've used this configuration uh, successfully numerous times. Um, without any issues whatsoever. Um, and again, it highlights our versatility <clears throat> in the uh, layout configurations. Um, this, is, this slide's a nifty little unit that shows um, it, it can, it's reversing, so it can move to either end of the conveyor. It has one end feed, and then it rotates to fill the bin um, in either, at either end of it. Like I said, it just kind of rotates around to distribute the material from one end of the bin along that arc to the other. <clears throat> Robert, let me interrupt you for one second. We have a question about watertight discharge gates for distribution. Um, so the typically all our gates are sludge tight. Um, they're not drip tight. So you shouldn't actually also be in a, in a truck loading or a distribution system, you shouldn't be holding water in your conveyor because the conveyor will, once it's done receiving sludge and it's set to shut down for the evening, it's gonna be emptied out before shut down. So those gates aren't, aren't holding anything for a period of time usually. So like I said, they're, they're drip, they're not drip tight, they're sludge tight. 
and they're, if you need a watertight gate, that's a much more expensive option, but not usually required for, a, for a, uh, loading a truck or a distribution conveyor like, like we've shown before. Um, but if needed, we can supply them. Okay, thanks for that, Jill. Um, moving along, shafted versus shaftless. Um, I don't know if you can kind of see what, uh, kind of hard to make out the top left slide there, but um, I believe what it's highlighting is um, the capacity. Because shaftless units do, don't have the tube running through the uh, center um, that the flights are welded to, we have a greater capacity. That area can be filled up with material. Um, the shafted unit, uh, shown on the left, has a less capacity. Um, and typically on a shafted unit, you can look, expect about 30% of the trough size of um, uh, effective material conveyance. Um, in a shaftless unit, 50% isn't a problem, plus 50% isn't a problem uh, because we have that area in the middle, especially in sludge. Now, these are sludge applications where the material is kind of coagulated and is conveyed as one you know, unit between the flights. Um, what we're showing here in the middle would be a shafted connection. Um, again, shaftless really doesn't need that. Um, and like I said, I'm not sure what we're trying to illustrate there, but I do know um, the one on the bottom left on the shafted portion, you need a hanger bearing once you exceed about 12 feet in a shafted unit. Um, it's been quite some time since I've done any work on shafted units. But hanger bearings are exposed to the material being forced into them just of the nature of the conveyance. Um, they have to be maintained. Um, they typically um, are not conducive with the concentricity of the entire unit. Therefore, you're going to get a lot of wear, undue wear unnecessarily. And uh, the shafted unit again, does not need any intermediate bearings. We can exceed 100 feet easily in a single run without the need of intermediate or hanger bearings. And <clears throat> again, just kind of reiterating what we just said, uh, we can eliminate the hanger bearings and um, shaftless conveyor can go 100% full. Um, and, then, and I can't emphasize enough about the, uh, the intermediate bearings. Uh, they're just, from my experience, are a nightmare to work with. Um, also, you're gonna need a greater horsepower because you've got more, um, uh, more steel that you have to rotate along or, you know, yeah, rotate along with the material. Um, again, the intermediate bearings or the shafted units are conducive to blockages or dead areas that the material won't be able to, uh, to be conveyed past. Um, and the shafted unit, of course, doesn't have anything like that. Um, and the shaftless unit doesn't have anything like that, excuse me. Anyways, um, like I said before, the longevity of a, a hanger bearing or intermediate bearing uh, isn't very good uh, because if you get like a gritty application or any material, that has some kind of wear, um, it's going to work on that bearing, and you're going to have to replace it. Um, and just on that note, a typical municipal sludge application, our units made to or typically last five to eight years before any major maintenance needs to be done. Not uncommon to get um, calls from our customers that exceeds that. Rarely, rarely do we get a call. Um, that our customers uh, need it before, say, five years. Three years is really, I don't think we've ever had any issues with that. Um, another big difference is um, screenings, where there's some fibrous material uh, that may be introduced uh, to the conveyor. The fibrous material on a shafted conveyor will wrap itself around the, the shaft, as well as the end shaft. Um, with a shaftless unit, the fibrous material, for lack of a better term, will unscrew itself if it does get wrapped around the spiral or the auger. Um, and then it just kind of falls out right at the end. So definite advantage. And um, 
Another thing that we're looking at is, the lubri as I mentioned, the lubrication and the maintenance. You, there's going to be high amount of maintenance intervals with an intermediate bearing. Um, again, back to the shaftless unit, very infrequent um, maintenance intervals. Um, you can, and to combat that, some people like to use the auto lube systems. Um, you're adding cost. Um, not sure our PowerPoint says it's unreliable. Not sure on that because we don't use those again, but we can avoid that cost. It won't be an extra component that you have to maintain. And again, as I mentioned, the low fill rates, because you've got the center tube, you just can't achieve the high fill rates as a shaft, shaftless unit. Real quick to touch on uh, conveyor belts versus shaftless. Um, conveyor belts uh, don't contain the material, obviously, and the shaft, shaftless unit does. Fully sealed, um, again, you can maintain or address any odor control issues that you would like. Again, this just, uh, because they're open to the atmosphere, it's just not possible to do that. Um, there's a lot of maintenance because the belts stretch with a conveyor belt. Again, maintenance intervals uh, in a shaftless unit are way less frequent um, with a conveyor belt, I mean, uh, than a conveyor belt. Um, also, you have to have access along the full length of the belt unit. Um, again, you don't really need to access the whole length of uh, um, <clears throat> the shaftless unit. Major advantage to a shaftless conveyor system versus a belt conveyor, multiple discharge points. Obviously with the belt, you only have one shaftless units. We can provide multiple units. And moving right into a cake pump, obviously there's a much higher cost associated with a cake pump than shaftless conveyor units. Um, Again, it, it's really all relative to the cost um, and the maintenance of a cake pump. But um, yeah, the, shaft, the shaftless units, again, they're much more cost effective, reliable, much less maintenance um, than is required with the cake pump. And on that note, um, I believe I'm pretty much done. I'm gonna hand it off to Jill here. So, um, if you have any questions, just chime right in. Okay. So we're going to talk a little bit about silos, um, live bottom silos and sliding frame silos. This is a live bottom configuration. So we're talking about the same shaftless spirals that Robert just touched on, only it's in the bottom of a silo or a storage bin. Try and start the video. Okay, so as you can see, there's your, your spirals moving in the bottom of the live bottom. Um, each spiral has its own gearbox and drive. Um, so if there's an issue, you're not gonna, your system would not go down. Um, the outloading arrangement can change. You can have it discharged towards the end, just like it's shown, or it could be a pulling arrangement, or you could have your discharges um, set up underneath the trough in all sorts of different arrangements to load directly to a truck. Okay, so this shows you a receiving bin. So we have a, a live bottom uh, arrangement of four screws or four spirals on the bottom, shaftless, and we embed it into a concrete tank. So your truck comes up, dumps in, and then those spirals move at a very low RPM to discharge that load to a receiving conveyor, conveyor or if, if choosing a, some kind of pump. But the, if you keep everything the same with a system, shaftless conveyors, shaftless live bottom, your, guy, your maintenance guys will be much happier only having to worry about one technology. Um, our live bottom arrangement can be set up as a single conveyor, a dual conveyor, almost like a W arrangement, or a UU, or two sets of U's, or four or screw, six screws on the bottom. So there's quite a bit of flexibility with the live bottom outloading arrangements. Excuse me, Jill, we've got another question. Um, Lloyd, um, Lloyd asked if um, you have any applications feeding an incinerator with a shaftless conveyor. Going, yes. So there's a temperature 
constraint receiving from an incinerator, but feeding into an incinerator, we can. Um, we have Nogtuck, Connecticut, where we go two stages, uh, almost 90 feet in the air, and load into their silo, which feeds into the, into the incinerator. So, um, yes, as long as there's not, you know, towards the end, if it becomes a temperature issue, we need to know about that because we maybe would change our liner from a UHMW to our um, hard ox, but we're very well aware of the temperature as you get closer to the silo um, incinerator. Uh, so yes, we can. Um, as you can see on this slide, you talk about where we have a horizontal, vertical, horizontal feeding into a truck or um, the third image over, you have a silo where we extended the troughs on the live bottom and fed directly into a truck. Or on the all the way to the right, you can load, like I mentioned, right from a silo into a truck. And those outlets from the silo live bottom can be staggered so we get an even outloading. Or go right from a live bottom to an incline and load into a truck. So there's quite a few options once you start looking into it. Um, here's a couple of examples of some of our silos. Um, a dual screw live bottom receiving from an incline, discharging to a truck, truck would drive through the bottom. Here are larger ones where we have four shaftless spirals on the bottom feeding into a cross collector. It, those spirals feed it perpendicularly and then that conveyor feeds into that incline that you can see over to the left. And then the picture on the right actually shows you our silos and we would discharge directly below into a, into a truck which you can see pull in in the top left hand corner as well as here's a um our inclines are going up and feeding and that's a big w trough on the left hand side where you have those spirals are they're, they're essentially just spread a little bit more so it helps us with our silo design makes it more efficient and here we are feeding some pumps directly from our silos the gearboxes and the motors would be on the opposite end to what you see transitions into your pump and here's some we're going to look at some really large silos and another larger is super sized um, and we'll talk quickly about some sliding frames so you have a circular sliding frame uh, and a rectangular sliding frame here's the video on the circular and the, so circular sliding frames are good if you have a material that could be sticky where bridging could be an issue um, the, it's hydraulically actuated, the sliding frame, and it moves at a gentle motion to spots in, in the bottom of that silo floor, and that would load up to a conveyor or it could go directly to a truck. Um, usually there's some kind of conveyor below it, and that would help you control the, the material as it's coming out. This is showing in the inside. This one actually had three. It was a very large diameter silo, 32 feet, and it has three independent um, sliding frames that move. So it gives size is really not an issue with when you're talking about sliding frames. As you can see on the on the right, that's a sliding frame going directly to a truck below. You can see in the bottom left picture that's our hydraulic piston, and then the chutes at the top left. This is just another arrangement of inclines, octagonal troughs, so you know it's greater than 30, 35 degrees, pushing, pushing into a horizontal, almost on the underside of the belly of the trough, and then that's feeding into your silo, and the silo is outloading to your truck. Uh, excuse me, Jill, Lloyd has another question, and Lloyd's question is, how much leakage do you get at the sliding frame shaft seal to the bin? There seems to be a problem at several installations I'm familiar with. I haven't heard of it being an issue, um, but I can, what I can do is I can look into it a little bit further and give you an answer after the presentation, if that's okay. Um, I, like I said, I haven't had it be an issue with us or something that has been brought to my attention, and usually if there's a problem, I usually hear about it. Um, but let me look into it, and I'll give you an answer. So here we are with um, four different circular sliding frames that are going directly into a truck, and then the last do you have another no, okay. we're great. Uh, the portion is our spire retainer. So this is a great piece of equipment for if you have um, your can is located in a, a red area where odors are a big issue. So you would have your system um, 
your conveyance system set up just like you would to load to a normal truck, except for it would be a closed system. So you would discharge from your shaftless conveyor into the top of your spiro retainer. And that would keep everything contained. And this would be picked up by your local hauler configured to your local hauling requirements. And it would be hauled to wherever you're bringing it to. And the, the end of the spiral retainer um, dumps. And I think we have a video. Let me just double check. So this gives you a little more idea. You can see the heavy rollers. It, it pulls on just like a roll on, roll off container. It has a little spiral in the middle of it. It's used as a leveling conveyor inside. Um, it's an odor tight seal. It's got a retractable slide gate. So once you're ready to leave your home base at the plant and get on the truck, you close your gate and it seals off everything above it. And then the truck picks it up and pulls it onto the bed. If you can see, there's a couple spiral retainers that are stainless steel. And then you have on the other picture, you have a little spiral retainer um, where there's conveyors are feeding it and loading it. Let's see. So here's our little video of the spiral retainer. There's your disconnect for your electrical in the plant. There's your retractable chute. You shut your manual gate. Yep, here's your hook to pull it up onto your truck, just like you would in a normal dumpster. Slides away, lifts it up, and then it would haul it off to your landfill or wherever you're distributing to. Um, and keep in mind, this is all contained, so there's no odor issue. And then when you get to the landfill, it dumps and your, your back gate opens. There's a little bit more, um, a longer video on YouTube if you're interested. Um, I can send anybody a link afterwards if they want or you can search Spirax, Spire Retainer. It's a good video. It really gets into more of a detail about the disconnects and the retractable shoe and the accessories. Um, so here we're gonna talk about some case studies. This is Western Riverside in California. So the, what they're doing here is they're taking dewatered sludge from centrifuges about filter presses and they're horizontally conveying it over. They're going vertical up and they're going horizontal over. And these are long runs, 150 feet, um, 75 feet. These are long runs to get to a solar drying building. And then what we've set up is there's conveyors at the top of the solar dryer building and they have discharge gates. So it's loading that solar dryer just like it would a truck. So it opens up a gate, loads out, closes it, goes to the next one and moves on down. And then from the solar dryer, they take the material, um, it's either pushed from, I don't know if they have one of those rovers or if they have um, a, you know, a truck come in or dumpster or a skidster come in and push the material, but it goes into a conveyor that is set below their solar drying bed and that conveys it up to an incline and over and we load a truck so they can get rid of it. So it's fully, all shaftless conveyors. Here are some of the pictures. Now there might be some audio that comes in the top picture. I'm trying not to go near it so it doesn't make a funny noise, but if you hear it, that's what it is. Um, but you can see in the bottom left, that's what's discharging from the solar dryer into our, they had, they essentially bedded, embedded that shaftless spiral into the concrete pit. So then once it, it just pushes it in there and the shaftless spiral moves it along. And that is a single conveyor, a hundred, I think it's 120 feet long, single drive. So that's, we had to, what Spirec really does well is the configuration for those long runs and those moving a lot of, moving a lot of material. So we have those options of configuring our spirals with um, maybe in the top, in the front end, we have to be an F, A, A, B spiral. And then as we move forward, we can change the pitches and change the consistency of the spiral so that we treat the sludge consistently all the way through. And that reduces our torque and the wear on the liner and the spiral. Um, these are just really good pictures of the solar dryer and um, the connections. Oh, see, sorry, that's why I <laughs> got rid of it quickly. Okay, so this is a air filter plant in California. Um, it is a Listec project that we worked with them on. What we did was we have, um, they had embedded their live bottom receiving into a concrete bin. So we supplied, supplied the live bottoms with the strapless spirals and they, um, let's see if I can do a pointer. Oh, 
Okay. Um, so they embedded the live bottoms into this into a concrete tank, and then they push out to a, a horizontal cross collector, which is an octagonal trough, and then it goes into dual OK 500s, and they go up about 25, 30 feet, and then they go horizontal over. And as you can see, that's our storage bin right there with four screws, and that discharges, and we have a, a couple of conveyors post that that go to feed force feed a pump, and they're using that pump to feed their process. Excuse me, we've got another question from James, or as we know him, Jim. Morning, Jim. Um, have you used a version of your live bottom to provide redundancy or diversion of sludge? Example, you have one belt filter press cur currently going to a hopper serving a dryer system. Owner wants a way to divert sludge from the belt filter press directly to truck and bypass the dryer when a dryer is down or being serviced. And yes, I do believe we can accomplish that, Jim. I think what you're saying is we can have a reversing conveyor. We can feed the middle, go one way or the other, or we can have a diverter chute from one uh, from the bin conveyor to the outload conveyor. If that was your question. The another option is is that you could have if you have a four screw live bottom, you could have two screws discharging to one setup on one side and two screws discharging to another setup on another side. So say um, so the right side of the silo goes to train A and that goes to your dryer and the left side of the bin goes to train B and that goes to load a truck. So there's configurations you can work with with that or, you know, like Robert mentioned, it could be a diverter, um, but you can dedicate um, screws within the live bottom to certain trains. Hope that answers your question. <laughs> um, and this just shows you a little bit more like the live, that's your live bottom, receivable bunker screws on the left and when we're talking about live bottom receiving bunkers, for the liner and the spiral, you have a significant life on them because they are not moving very fast. They're probably six, eight RPM, and they, when they are moving, they usually always have material. So you could easily see eight, 10, 12 years on a liner. Um, we have some plants that haven't even touched liners or spirals that have been in for 12 years that have a live bottom receivable bunker. Um, and they use those. They're seeing 15 trucks a day coming in there. Uh, this here, you can see the right picture is that uh, storage silo for, for List Tech. Um, it's a very good looking bin, I have to say. Uh, and this is your post bin. You can see the right side of the picture is your octagonal cross collector, and that feeds into your vertical, which then force feeds into your pump. Um, so that up and it gives you the option to reduce your pumping pipe distance and use conveyance, which um, isn't as sensitive to high percent solids and is less maintenance. And then one more case study that we have is uh, Bergen Point. They, are, they have some pretty long, these are all 75 foot long U620s, which is a French trough. And they have quite a few belt filter presses that are feeding into it. And they had dual trains. So what you can see in the middle is a, is a um, cross conveyor it will go from one side to the other, depending on what trucks they want to load. Uh, they had uh, they had originally had some uh, some other conveyors in there that were not sized properly. So Spire was able to come in and, and offer a solution for this that helped them, and they're they're very happy. They've been running for seven years, eight years, so it's it's been a good good installation for them. As you can see, this is the discharge end on the last conveyor on the right. Uh, the one more case study is um, West Central, and that's Avon. So we have some Flatwick centrifuges that are going to discharge to short inclines. They go up to verticals, and then they're on the track. So what's cool about this installation is fully automated. So when I say that, I mean ultrasonic level sensors. Everything is telling there's not someone that has to sit there and say what to do, it's all automated. That sensor says, okay, this you know outlet number one is full, I'm gonna shut my gate and I'm gonna move on to outlet number two or I'm going to change directions to go to the other outlet so that there, it's, it's fully automated, um, very little operator interface. And that's it, guys. That blew by. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so we're gonna exit out so you can see Robert and I, if there's any other questions, does anyone wanna post them? Uh, 
Stop share. That's what we needed. Okay. Um, anything, if anyone, oh, any, let's see. I think that's just me. Um, question and answer. Okay. Um, okay. Jim, I think we answered your question. If not, let me know. Um, yes, so I mentioned that when you're feeding into a dryer, um, when you get close to the dryer, it does get really warm. So our UHMW does have a, have a melting point, I want to say it's around 225, and what happens is it just starts getting softer. So what we would do is we could pour, substitute out a portion of our Hardox liner or another maybe a polyurethane versus polyethylene liner. Um, and for that could be for just the section that's closest to that dryer, because we want to stay with the, um, as long as it's large or something like that, we want to stay with the UHMW, our DuraFlow liner, because that's what works best with our equipment. Um, but yeah, we, we do have options. Um, so, Competitors? Yeah, I'm not sure what he's looking for there, Ty. Yes, we have competitors. <laughs> um, isolation, you're running the live bottom bins. Okay, so um, for the live bottom bins that are the, really, I would say any live bottom bin that's going to be storing material, you want to have a beefy gate. Um, we would we could put on like a staff show or something like that, which is sludge tight, drip tight, liquid tight, any of the above. Um, and that's what we've used in the past. Um, if the plant has a different type of gate that they would prefer, we can work with that. We're, we're open to that, but that's usually who we've gone with. Um, we've had good, uh, we've had really good luck with the ultrasonic level sensors. We use the Siemens. Um, I don't know about if we've done radar, because Siemens are all laser, right? Yeah, ultrasonic. Yeah. yeah. So I don't know if we, we haven't tried any other ones, but they're all the Siemens ultrasonic and they've been good. Um, I haven't heard of it being an issue with levels or them not working as they're supposed to. Are there options for easily changing? Are there options for easily changing conveyor inclination, possibly make transport of here a little easier and trailer? Yes. So, sure. um, we can, what I would say is that you would size the conveyor for the incline that you're going to have. And what happens is, is the steeper of an incline you go, the less efficient the conveyor becomes. But we can account for that when we have a tight pitch spiral or we just, it's just something we count for in our calculations so we can size for it. So, you know, most definitely, yeah, you can, you can have it changing elevations like on a, a trailer or, you know, you have your um, sample units or your test units that you're going out around the yeah, we can go. and comment on system supply. Spirac can provide a full system, conveyance, um, solids handling, conveyance of solids handling, storage. As you can see by the project summaries that I brought up there, um, we combine, combine complete systems. So Spirec is involved in the whole solids handling system and we're responsible for that. And those have been great installations. Those customers are very happy. Um, the equipment is running as it's supposed to. So if you have a system you'd like to talk to us about, we'd be happy to hear about it and offer our, um, our comments. And yes, we will send this presentation. I don't know if it comes in a PDF. I can ask Peter, but I don't think it'll be a big deal if you want it in PDF. Yeah, I think we could probably convert that easy enough. Hey, we survived this. I can do anything. <laughs> um, anybody else have any other questions? Sludge pumps. Um, so, Spire to do sludge pumps, and a couple things to think about with the sludge pumps is the, is, and again, I'm not a sludge per person, but um, I understand that higher solids have sometimes an issue with the sludge pumps as well as the maintenance that goes along with those. Um, shaftless spirals do not. There, We don't have an issue. We, as you can see by the um, project summary, we were going from a solar drying bed, um, which is 80% solids, 90% solids, um, and we were conveying that out and out. Oh, no, ah, so we don't have an issue with those. Um, and then the maintenance is going to be a lot less. Um, I can have you talk to some of our installations that have pulled sludge pumps and have put in shaftless conveyors, and they're much happier. At least the maintenance guys are. Do you offer hand legs? Yes. Yes, we absolutely do. Um, 
sealing provisions to that. Well, they're completely contained. Um, there is seals between the conveyor discharge and either end. Um, they can be open to atmosphere or seal against another piece of equipment. It's a diverter flap gate in the middle. So, you know, that can be manual, that can be automated, it can be whatever way you want to do it. But yes, and that would flange, you could flange up to either just, you know, receiving device. Okay. Uh, okay. We'll look into that. Yeah. <clears throat> All right. Any other questions for anybody from anybody? And um, we'll have my contact info and Robert's, Robert's contact info on the email. So if you want to shoot over an email afterwards, we can. Uh, I haven't done, but I will look for me. Um, but yeah, so thank you all for joining us. Um, we appreciate it. We know your time's valuable, so I'm glad we, we were under the hour that we had planned, and hopefully we can do it again soon and showcase some of our other equipment. Anything, Robert? No, just like that. If you do have any other questions, we will have our contact information. Please feel free to contact us, and uh, we'll get that addressed. All right. Thank you very much. Have a good day. Bye.